Emerging technologies like artificial intelligence rely on a foundation of semiconductor chips, which have become a high priority for the federal government in the last few years. Today, our conversation with 2023 WASH 100 Award winner Cameron Sherry, Vice President and General Manager of Intel Public Sector, centered around AI and semiconductor chip innovation, two elements seen as vital to technological advancement in the United States. If you enjoyed today's interview, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. And if you're interested in being interviewed, email summer at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Ryan, and here to speak with me today is Cameron Sherry, Vice President and General Manager of Intel Public Sector. Cameron, thank you so much for joining us today. Summer, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be part of the series. So, Cameron, I'm curious, which emerging technologies do you anticipate will be most impactful in the public sector in the next few years? You know, it's a really good opening question, Summer, and I think what's really uh, taking a lot of the time and a lot of the energy in the marketing segments today is all centered around generative AI. Generative AI is, is one of these types of things that is going to be um, profound in its effect in the industry itself and across the rest of humanity, whether you're in public sector, financial services, healthcare. It's really providing us a new set of insights that we had not seen prior and allowing us to see it faster. We have richer data sets. We have a lot of data, right? We have a lot of people producing data and content with all these digitally connected devices. And being able to produce that is almost untenable for just a single human being. So being able to augment the human being with AI is going to be absolutely profound. It's going to drive decision making, uh, new insights, new discoveries, all kinds of exciting things, I think, in this space. Generative AI has certainly created quite the buzz in the news recently. How do you think AI can be applied in DOD missions and public sector applications in the future? Well, it's interesting. We're already seeing benign use cases, but they're they're emerging in their complexity. If I look at AI as a spectrum, you know, from a very easy, very simple to understand to very complex tasking, I think we're really on the beginning of the easy, moving into the more moderately sophisticated AI. Great examples. Look at Customs and Border Patrol and the way that they manage ports, brilliant. They're doing some fascinating work, uh, being able to capture RFID information, being able to look at cargo on ships, and being able to preload a lot of the things that they would do from an inspection perspective before a ship even reaches the port. So when you think of all that data being collected, the analysis that has to happen to determine the cargo coming off the ship, its safety rating, where it's getting deployed to so that you can pre-stage assets. Really, really great work that CBP is doing over there. If I look at healthcare, um, healthcare using AI to be able to get better determinant results from things like uh, x-rays and other areas of healthcare that become extremely profound um, is very, very progressive. And when you look at how it's looking for things about predetermining cancerous cells or other aspects, and I think of health and the VA and our great veterans. Um, it's really interesting that some of the use cases that are emerging from a DOD perspective, we have heads up displays happening in the field with real time analysis and information happening for the warfighter. So these are, are really more simple use cases that are supplementing or augmenting the current capability of the human. But I could see the use cases getting far more sophisticated as we continue to move forward. I think the areas that we'll target will be cyber. We're seeing a lot of AI and cyber uh, in the defensive realms and also for exploitation, which is a really positive thing. Um, so there's use cases about everywhere in every mission segment, even if it's something just creating situational awareness better, using better autonomy in vehicles, better fuel efficiency in vehicles, all these things contribute to maximizing the mission outcome. As a relatively new technology, AI poses risks and can be daunting for leaders to harness. What are some of the challenges you anticipate federal leaders needing to address in order to move forward with AI adoption? Yeah, really good question. When you think of AI, it's a tool, 
just like anything else. And with all technology uh, as a tool for use in the mission, you have to be able to govern and manage it effectively. So being able to set those parameters and guidelines for transparency, ethics, ensuring that there's no bias in algorithm, these are all great things that we have to look at from a policy perspective. For decision makers at the agency or the division level, it's really important to remember that AI is just another capability for use in the mission execution. And when you look at the way that we build capability today, it's really very simple. You have to choose the hardware or silicon necessary for the mission environment that best meets the constraints of the, of the mission environment in a safe and secure manner. So things like zero trust start to come into play. You have to then choose the software. And again, software with security built in is very, very important, especially when dealing with AI and the algorithms and the things that come with it. And then also data security is a piece of the software component as well. But it's really important to center around the mission scenario you're solving for. Sometimes we get lost a bit in this space, uh, drifting away from the actual mission scenario because we get so focused on the technology. So I think it's really, really important that as you build your mission strategies, you understand what technology or what role technology plays in that mission execution. And I think that's the real key thing. Uh, look, AI is a great emerging trend. It will have a very positive effect on us as a, as a nation, but also mankind when it's applied with for good with those types of principles. Um, but we also have to remember it's not the primary focus. The primary focus is what we're, we're doing in the mission itself. And we have to ensure that that scenario becomes the anchoring point of how we decide to leverage AI. So Cameron, we've been talking about AI and emerging technologies, and I know semiconductor chips are the foundation for a lot of these technologies. The government is investing billions into the semiconductor chip industry in the U.S. through the CHIPS Act, which passed in August 2022. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the CHIPS Act and how it could boost domestic chip manufacturing in the next few years. Look, uh, arguably, the CHIPS Act has been a, a very quintessential piece of legislation that we've not seen really since the Cold War era. And, you know, it's a testament to our government and the forward thinking that our leaders have when you think about how we remain competitive uh, within the world stage as, as we exist as a country. And I think the investment to rebalance uh, supply chain is, is very important. We learned during the pandemic that supply chain and supply chain disruption becomes uh, a critical uh, focal point that we need to be concerned about and just to create continuity and resiliency within the semiconductor industry. Uh, investing in industry is nothing new that the government has done, right? We've invested in certain industries during our uh, industrial revolution. We've thrived in those areas. We've created great economical settings and policy settings that allowed uh, capitalism to flourish in the country. So that's a really good thing. For semiconductors, I think what this is, is coming into our own second right, I would say, you know, when Intel was first founded and we were the originators of Moore's Law and what can actually occur uh, through innovation, through the power of Moore's Law and semiconductors, it was 50 over 50 years ago. Now we're coming into this second wave where semiconductors have become um, even more potent and more powerful on the world stage. When you think of the digital economy and what's coming with the digital economy and what's already here, you know, we have a lot of users walking around with smartphones today that we didn't have 20 years ago. Matter of fact, we didn't even have them 15 years ago when you really think of these types of innovations. Now every person's got a smartphone, some for a tablet, uh, some sort of in, uh, laptop or ultra book, something they're walking around with to be not only content consumers, but content creators. And then ingesting all of that information. And silicon is at the heart of that. You know, we love to say in our company, you know, software is the heart and soul of silicon, but you still need silicon at some point to be able to actually compute, make sense of information and actually drive the information age. So it's become very, very important. And I think that, you know, the government and the policymakers and everyone that has supported the CHIPS Act 
really has taken a forward-leaning progressive view of where the digital economy is moving to, and they've taken the proper investment steps to be able to make sure that this industry can flourish, we can mitigate risk in supply chain of what we learned during the pandemic, and really look at some sort of prosperous future for the digital economy. And Cameron, as you mentioned, Intel has been a major player in the semiconductor industry. I'm curious, what do you think is next for semiconductor chip innovation? Where do you see opportunities for future advancement with chip technology? I'm very excited about this summer. I will freely admit transparently, um, growing up as a systems engineer, I took for granted at some point just the role silicon played in the overall compute spectrum, uh, building enterprise architectures. What has been absolutely extraordinary for me and one of the most exciting aspects for me in my career is understanding what's coming in the world of silicon. When I think of things like multi-chip packaging and the profound effect that's going to have, where you can actually create a system on a chip, if I think to myself where we were at five, even five years ago with servers becoming smaller, uh, more dense, more capacity within data centers, we're now getting into a world of realization where I can build more things, more multifunction use capabilities on a single chip, i.e. system on a chip where I could have transmission capabilities, whether it's 5G or Wi-Fi, I can have compute, I can have GPU so I can process AI algorithms. Now, all of a sudden, this whole new world opens up to me to be able to really deal with the tactical edge in the mission space, because these chips I can now embed in just about anything. And as they become smaller, and as we reach the next generation of Moore's Law, with almost one trillion transistors on, on these substrates, it is extraordinary what's going to happen in the world. Being able to get into all these different types of functions, I, I think, is really going to be a game-changing thing in the next three or five or seven years as we get on this journey towards quantum computing and the profound uh, innovations that are going to happen when that happens. Lastly, Cameron, what are some of the things we'll need to focus on and overcome in order to get to that future of profound innovation? So I think first and foremost, it's a pretty common answer for that, but it's going to be policy. We always seem to uh, lag in policy keeping up with the pace of technology, but that's that's okay, right? That That happens all the time in our industry. What we have to really rethink is how do we accelerate giving the the proper information to decision makers in order to rapidly accelerate policy. Um, at times, I believe the lag in policy is a good thing because it, it lets us look at the world pragmatically. It helps us look at how users are actually adopting technology so that we can make better data-driven decisions and data-driven informed decisions with regards to policy. That will always be a big challenge. I think the second thing we have to figure out is how we adopt these types of technologies and the innovations that are coming in a more rapid pace. As technology begins to accelerate, what we find is it's not the advancement of technology that troubles us, it's the adoption. And being able to adopt it for good mission function, being able to advance mission, uh, even against our near peers and being able to have leading edge capability, it's really important to be able to adopt change. And I don't know about you, Summer, but I can tell you post COVID and the effect it had on me, my, my, abil my brain's ability to ad adopt the change has been challenged at best. But being able to do that, I think is one of the key things to be able to keep up with the rapid pace that's gonna be before us. Um, but those two things and then designing in this continuous improvement, continuous development type of cycle, I think it's gonna be extremely important and it's gonna to have to be a mainstream thought process. So it comes back to what's old is new again, Summer. It's always about changing hearts and minds, understanding that when technology is applied for good, it can have an absolutely profound effect on us, continuing to focus on policy, shape, policy shaping and uh, using that data to continue to inform us. Awesome, well, Cameron, thank you so much for your time today and for all the work you do at Intel. Thank you, Summer, have a wonderful day.